Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm really excited about our speaker. Um, uh, it, it, good friend of MRES for many years. Uh, just got a couple quick things. I just want to mention that we do have a solar boat regatta coming up on May 21st, and we would very much like to have any and all of you attend, or uh, if there's any schools in your area that you think might be interested, uh, myself or Mark Weber would be happy to talk to them and try to encourage them to participate. It's a, it's a fun event, and this is our 30th year of doing that. So we're we're really excited about uh, you know what's what's coming. So uh, the other thing I just wanted to do was is uh, introduce uh, Patrick. Patrick is the director of climate change, energy, and the environment department of water and climate change center for research and collections. Uh, and he's been with the Science Museum a number of years. Um, he's also also uh, married to a, a good friend of ours at MRES, uh, J. Drake Hamilton. And uh, uh, so I, I'm just very happy to have him uh, present tonight. And Patrick, if you wanna go ahead and get started. And, and if you have other things you wanna add to your bio, but you know, feel free to do that, so. Doug, thank you uh, for that very nice introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak to MRES this evening. You, you all know I work at the Science Museum, but I just thought I'd give you a little personal bio of things that I'm passionate about because what I really care deeply about. And um, I love kayaking. I, I love being part of the, uh, what I call the soft water season of Minnesota when we ice melts and uh, we go from hard water back to uh, soft water. Really looking forward to that. But uh, also a, a big ho hobby of mine is, is growing fruit. I have uh, planted and I maintain a small orchard in a community garden just a few blocks away from where I, I live in St. Paul. And uh, this next slide is of the, the plums that uh, Won a blue ribbon at the Minnesota State Fair. Wow. And then the, here are the peaches on the way to the Minnesota State Fair where they, they won a blue ribbon. Mm. <laughs> and here are the pears still on the tree before they got plucked to go to the State Fair where they won a blue ribbon. Mm. And here are the cherries that, well, they didn't make it to the state fair because they make an excellent liqueur. And there's nothing like the taste of July in December that I have found. But uh, when I'm not being an amateur fruit grower or when I'm not in my kayak, I work at the Science Museum of Minnesota. And Doug said I've been there for a while and that's absolutely true. I've been there for, there for 37 years. <laughs> I, wasn't <laughs> gonna, I wasn't gonna date you. <laughs> You, you let me do it, that's <laughs> And uh, over that uh, time, I've developed a wide variety of exhibits and programs and demonstration projects on all sorts of environmental issues. Uh, but over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, I've really focused on energy, water, and climate change. And that work has really been animated, uh, informed by three key ideas. But first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit more about myself. I was born in the Detroit Lakes in West Central Minnesota. And growing up amongst the woods and lakes of that part of the country invented in me a love of the environment that's endured my whole life. Shortly after this picture was taken, my parents moved me and my three older brothers to Moorhead in the heart of the Red River Valley. And what that landscape lacks in drama was more than made up with by an atmosphere that could produce tornadoes, blizzards, thunderstorms, and hail. And that's where I developed my, my passion for climatology and meteorology. But after I graduated from high school, I decided it was time to leave the prairie and pursue my studies at an Eastern University. So at the University of Minnesota Duluth, I majored in geography. And then I thought it was time to get a taste of Southern culture. 
So I came out of the Twin Cities and got a master's degree in geography, specializing in water resources and climatology. And then I, I worked for one year as an environmental planner for the Metropolitan Council back in the early 80s as part of a, a large team grappling with what was then the big environmental challenge, how to manage the enormous amounts of waste produced by a large metropolitan area. And then I came to the Science Museum, I've been there ever since. And my work is, is centered on three key ideas. The first one is that we dominate the planet. Humanity now dominates the chemical, physical, and biological processes that make this world habitable. The second key idea that informs my work is that we have tremendous assets because this planet is now home to the healthiest, wealthiest, best educated, most innovative, creative, and connected populace august cohort, which is great because we need to innovate and we need to do it now because collectively humanity has set in motion large scale planetary changes. And I'm not gonna numb you by articulating all the ways in which humanity now dominates the planet. This evening, I just wanna focus on three. Water, biodiversity, and climate change. With a particular focus about uh, here in, in Minnesota. So first of all, water. Minnesota is fortunate in having some of the most productive, fertile agricultural land in the world. A key feature that makes this land so productive is an underground drainage system that, has been, that underlies hundreds of thousands of acres in southern and central and western Minnesota. It keeps those landscapes from getting too wet and thereby reducing uh, yields. But what that means is that runoff of sediment and agricultural chemicals, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers, go directly into our waterways and ultimately to the Minnesota River. And in this image where the Minnesota and the Mississippi River come together just below Fort Snelling, the st stark difference in the water quality is apparent with the Minnesota River carrying enormous quantities of sediment and dissolved in there is large amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen. The other big challenge is biodiversity. Biodiversity, unfortunately, is declining worldwide here in the United States, in the upper Midwest, and in Minnesota. And one of the big drivers of decline in biodiversity is agriculture, because we've taken enormous swaths of land around the world and converted them to crops to raise our foods, understandably. And here in Minnesota, corn and soybeans, just those two plant species alone, cover an area the size of the Twin Cities metropolitan area. And then climate change. Climate change is underway here in Minnesota in a multitude of ways. I just wanna highlight one, and that is the fact that last summer's drought notwithstanding, New England, the central states, and the upper Midwest have all been trending toward increasing wetness. And superimposed upon this trend toward increasing precipitation is increasing incidences of extreme rainfalls. Now, it's not that these events have never happened before, because we have observations going back into the 19th century of extreme rainfalls. But there has been a stunning increase in their occurrence since the turn of the 21st century. In fact, I need to update this chart because the last time I updated this chart was like in 2017 and extreme rainfalls have continued to occur with frequency. And when these rainfalls happen early in the growing season before our row crops of corn and soybean and others are able to leaf out and protect the soil, the soil erosion can be catastrophic. This increase in heavy and extreme rain is one indication that our climate already is behaving substantially differently than it has in recorded history. 
Kidney Blumenfeld, Senior Climatologist, Minnesota State Climatology Office. So we have water challenges, biodiversity challenges, and climate challenges, and they're all interrelated. So what is the Science Museum doing on these, on these issues? Well, first of all, when it comes to water, the Science Museum has a research station called the St. Croix Watershed Research Station, the freestanding facility about 40 miles to the northeast of the Science Museum on the St. Croix River. And that team has extremely deep expertise on exploring the interconnections between land use, land cover, and water quality in our lakes, streams, and rivers. And here they are taking a sediment core out of a lake in the middle of the winter. That team is also focused on biodiversity. In particular, exploring ways in which we can increase the biodiversity and reduce our over-reliance on annual row crops and look for new ways that we can develop perennial crops that cover the landscape year round with vegetation and provide a wide variety of environmental services. And then there's climate change. And climate change in particular is the area that I have focused on over the last 10 to 15 years. And one of the aspects of, the, of climate change that the museum is particularly focused on is that emissions of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere come from a wide variety of sources, but buildings are a remarkable source of greenhouse gas emissions. Because buildings alone here in the United States are responsible for 40% of all primary energy use and the equivalent contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. So what can we do to reduce the climate change footprint of buildings? Well, some of you may be familiar with Science House. This is a freestanding building located on the Science Museum's campus. I led the team that designed, constructed it back in the early 2000s. It is a residential scale building. It's about 1,700 square feet. It was uh, built to serve as the headquarters for the museum's outdoor environmental science space. But it was also designed to test the hypothesis of whether it was possible to design, construct, and operate a building in Minnesota's climate that could produce as much energy as it uses on an annual basis. By pairing up a PV integrated roof with a ground source heating and cooling system. And what we learned from this applied research project is yes, it is possible to design, construct, and operate buildings in Minnesota that can produce as much energy as they use on an annual basis. Science House was one of the first net zero buildings in Minnesota. Construction was finished in 2003. Now, a much bigger challenge, of course, is the Science Museum itself in the background, because unlike Science House, which is like a residential scale science structure, the Science Museum of Minnesota is 370,000 square feet. And 10 years ago, when we did a, an energy analysis of the Science Museum, that building alone, just the Science Museum itself, used as much electricity as every single household in a 20 block area of St. Paul. So it had an enormous energy and therefore environmental footprint. One of the things that we did was implement an advanced heat recovery system at the Science Museum. Here's a dirty little secret about large buildings. They use enormous amounts of electricity and therefore they produce huge amounts of heat. That heat has to be managed, otherwise the interiors of large buildings will quickly become uninhabitable. So how do we manage that heat? Well, typically in the United States, what we do is we throw it away. We dispel of it as quickly and easily as possible. And then use other forms of energy to do the work that could have been done with the heat energy that we just threw away. So I'm standing in front of two what are called heat recovery chillers that the Science Museum installed and began operating in 2015. It's a fancy new name for a heat pump. What it allows us to do is to extract heat energy from parts of the building where we do not want it, where it's building up in excess and transfer it to other parts 
of the museum where we need it for heating. This system alone cut the Science Museum's purchases of hot water by 60%, cut our greenhouse gas emissions by a third. And while well, you have to spend money in order to save energy and money, we did spend $900,000 on this project, but it's saving us $300,000 a year. So it's more than paid for itself. Encouraged by that result of the advanced heat recovery system, the Science Museum in 2019 adopted carbon neutrality as an institutional goal. Specifically, what we said we would do is that we would reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 50% or more by 2030, if not sooner, and achieve 100% carbon neutrality by 2050, if not sooner. Well, I'm the one who keeps track of the Science Museum's carbon emissions. And I updated our chart back in January and determined that the Science Museum had already reduced its carbon emissions 86% from their peak in early 2014. So with that result, the Science Museum just uh, a month ago updated its goal. Our goal now is to achieve 100% carbon neutrality by 2030, eight years from now and 20 years ahead of our previous schedule. Another big change at the Science Museum is last fall, the St. Croix Watershed Research Station with its expertise in water and biodiversity was, was merged with my department of global change initiatives with its expertise in energy and climate change to create a new department of water and climate change at the Science Museum, where we can integrate all of our assets together, our strengths, and look at, at issues in a more holistic way. So for instance, this is the community solar garden that the Science Museum subscribes to, located in South Central Dakota County. We subscribed back in 2017, and when we did so, I was curious about what the land use was where this solar array is located right now. And before it was a community solar garden, it was corn. And I uh, know that about 40% of the corn grown in Minnesota is used to produce ethanol. So I was curious about how the energy production of an acre of corn for ethanol and an acre of land devoted to solar compared to one another. So I did the math and I promise this is the one and only multiple choice question of the evening. An acre devoted to producing solar electricity yields how much energy annually compared to the same acre devoted to growing corn for ethanol production? A, 19% less, or B, the same amount, because whether it's an acre of solar or an acre of corn, they both get the same amount of solar radiation. C, 190% more, or D, 1900% more. Well, I know I'm talking to an audience of folks that have been passionate about renewable energy for a long time, and you're probably not surprised by the answer, but I sure was, 1900% more. An acre of solar compared to an acre of corn grown to produce ethanol produces 19 times more energy. So if we're gonna use some of our agricultural land to produce energy, which is what we're doing by growing corn and converting it into ethanol, why not use that land to produce far more energy and also multiple benefits? For instance, we know that when we put solar, whether it's on a rooftop or in a rural landscape, we're producing zero carbon energy. And that's extremely important because President Biden has set a goal of reducing carbon dioxide emissions from the United States by 50 to 52% from 2005 levels by 2030. It's an ambitious goal, but it's an important goal in order to achieve our contribution to reducing climate change globally. Not only do we need to produce more clean electricity, 
we need to expand the use of electricity to replace our use of fossil fuels in other forms. For example, my wife and I several years ago replaced our natural gas hot water heater with an electric powered heat pump water heater. And of course, EV transportation is accelerating in popularity. And so what we need to do is look for opportunities to electrify everything in order to reduce and ultimately eliminate our need for burning coal, oil, and natural gas. But we also know that solar produces not only zero carbon energy, but it can be a rich opportunity to create jobs. Jobs are in the site development and the ongoing operation and maintenance of solar facilities. And in particular, in our rural areas, these can be very good paying jobs and help to diversify our rural economies. But if we also take solar arrays and we seed them with pollinator friendly pollinator, um, perennial pollinator plants, we would not only produce habitat for pollinators and grassland wildlife habitat, but expand the biodiversity of our rural landscapes, which right now are dominated by row crop agriculture of corn and soybeans. And if we seed solar arrays with pollinator friendly perennials, we also achieve some carbon sequestration because here's what's happening after all. Those plants are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and through photosynthesis are converting them into complex carbohydrates, some of which are in the biomass that is above the surface. But with a lot of prairie plants, a tremendous amount of that biomass, that carbon that is taken out of the atmosphere is put back deep into the soil in the form of organic matter. And there's also an opportunity to actually still produce food from land that's devoted to solar arrays. Because after all, vegetation under solar arrays has to be managed. We either manage it mechanically by mowing it, or we manage it biologically by grazing it. And here's a, a chart that my colleagues at the Department of Water and Climate Change produced. Meat is on the left-hand side and energy is on the right-hand side. So let's take an acre and grow corn on it. If you feed that corn to beef, you get nearly 1,500 pounds of meat per acre per year. If you take that corn and you feed it to hogs, you get, oh, about 2,300 pounds of meat per acre per year. But if you take that corn and you feed it through an ethanol plant, you get energy. And then the dry distiller grains that are left over from the fermentation, if you feed that to cattle, you can get some meat in addition. So from an acre of corn, you can get both energy and meat. But if that same acre is covered in solar and you use sheep to manage the vegetation, you get 19 times more energy and you get a significant amount of meat nonetheless. So we can get all these benefits and then we also can get water quality improvements. Whatever. So anytime we take <clears throat> a low crop agriculture and convert it to a solar with perennial vegetation underneath it, we can enhance water quality. Because after all, that, that landscape is no longer exposed to wind and solar erosion for most months of the year, no longer requires any applications of nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizer that can potentially run off. But I want to raise an idea for you about how we could get even greater water quality benefits from the solar. This is some modeling work that my colleagues did in the Muse Museum's Department of Water and Climate Change. This is the south branch of the Watanon River in south central Minnesota. And all the polygons that you see that are in that periwinkle color, that light blue, those are irregularly shaped fields 
that are difficult for farmers to cultivate with their modern equipment. So what we modeled was this idea. What if those irregularly shaped parcels of land that are difficult for farmers to cultivate, what if they were instead put in solar and the farmers you know, get annual uh, lease fees from, uh, from those solar arrays. They're seeded with pollinator friendly perennials and we use sheep to manage the landscapes. What would we accomplish? Well, the model results indicate that we could reduce in, by increase water quality by 60%, reduce sediment loading into lakes and streams by 60%, reduce sediment and nutrient loading of nitrogen and phosphorus by 60%. So solar can produce good water quality gains, but if we are more intentional about where we put solar on the landscapes, we could achieve even greater water quality improvements. And then also we can enhance our resilience to climate change, particularly to extreme rainfalls, which are becoming increasingly prevalent. For instance, this was, uh, I think, the June rainfall in the summer of 2018, which we had an extraordinary, extraordinarily wet early summer. And by taking these irregularly parceled parcels of land adjacent to waterways, converting them with solar with perennial vegetation underneath them, we would help to significantly reduce downstream flooding potential from extreme rainfall. And then just one other thought about more distributed solar across our landscape. That doing so would more broadly distribute the economic benefits of solar across Minnesota. And I understand the appeal of developing systems like this, where maybe you only are dealing with one landowner and only the permitting for one site. But again, if we were able to look for opportunities to distribute solar more broadly across the landscape, and specifically on those sites that would gain us water quality and, and soil and uh, flood protection, we would also be distributing solar to more landowners across Minnesota. And more people would be benefiting directly from solar. Because with solar, we have an amazing opportunity. Solar now outcompetes the burning of coal to produce electricity. Solar is not only an enormous opportunity to help address climate change, but thoughtfully cited could also significantly improve our water quality and biodiversity challenges. Because here we are, we live on a human dominated planet. The future earth will be determined by human decision-making, either by default or by design, either by accident or by intention. So let's imagine design and realize the more secure water, biodiversity and climate future that we all want and need. And I really greatly appreciate the opportunity this evening to present to an audience committed and engaged in doing exactly that. So with that, I am finished and I yield the floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Patrick, if, if you, uh, I read an article the other day in some place in Europe where they're now actually putting solar over all of the rivers, um, you know, not huge rivers, but uh, medium sized rivers, because that, you know, that is unused property and they're limited land resources. They're actually installing solar uh, over the top of the rivers. Have you seen anything on that? No, Doug, that is very interesting. I have not seen that. What it reminds me of, and it's it's a different application, but in some ways similar, I have seen in China, uh, solar uh, floating on reservoirs in order to uh, reduce the amount of water that evaporates off those reservoirs. Right. So producing not only electricity, but also helping to uh, 
lower the, the loss of, of water from evaporation, particularly on in the summertime. Yeah, so the, the, Doug, I think, Doug, I think there's board. some questions in the chat that maybe he should address. Yeah, that the, the, uh, the Minnesota Power is actually putting solar on top of some of their ponds up there that they've created with the mines, which look good. So Ellie, can you uh, grab some of the questions or, or Patrick, can you see them in the chat? I, I've opened the chat and I'm, um, I will scroll up to the top. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, distributed solar needs high power grid access. It is not always close by. How do we fix this, especially if some landowners refuse overhead easement needed? Let me roll this down a little bit. Oops. Anyway, I think the idea is refuse overhead easements needed for power lines. Yes, I think um, that questionnaire is, is absolutely right. The solar can't go just anywhere on our rural landscapes. It needs access to uh, transmission. After all, those electrons have to get to, to market. And I would, uh, I, I think of this as comparable to what uh, I think of as, as our rural um, road network. Our rural areas are crisscrossed with township roads, county roads, state highways. And ultimately, I think we need to think about how we enhance our electrical transportation system in Minnesota. So that if landowners want to produce a crop of clean, clean electrons, there actually are ways of getting those to market. So it is something that I think we need to address as a society of how we actually allow electrons to get from landowners who want to raise that crop to market. I'll roll, scroll down a little bit more. And is there, was there another question? I'm sending one, hang on. So while Chris is doing that, Patrick, I have a uh, one question regarding your interface or interactions with um, two groups. One, uh, the Star Tribune had an article on ethanol, ethanol production last Sunday in the business section. Uh, and then also there was a town hall with Governor Waltz and people from the land stewardship project. So in your capacity, uh, have you had any interface with either of these groups? So, um... I have, uh, with uh, former Commissioner of Agriculture, uh, Dave Fredrickson, we have written a commentary about the potential for rural, rural solar to achieve multiple environmental and economic benefits. Uh, we're shopping it around. It has not yet found um, um, someone to, uh, to print it. So, uh, uh, I can't speak directly to um, to the ethanol community. Um, and it I, seemed and like in your research, me. ethanol production wasn't very viable in contrast to, you know, using the land for other purposes. Well, I think uh, ethanol is viable because, after all, um, there are uh, farmers are making money off of uh, making ethanol. But when an acre of land could produce 19 times more energy with solar, I think that there are uh, potentially even more lucrative opportunities. I think that solar could potentially outcompete uh, ethanol as a way of, of producing um, income off the land. Now, we would 
said solar can produce 19 times more energy per acre than, than solar, I mean, than, than corn. That doesn't mean that we need every acre of corn to be converted to, to solar, given its extremely high efficiency at, in converting energy into energy compared to, to corn. But I think it, it raises significant opportunities for, for farmers to uh, take uh, portions of their land out of production that are difficult to cultivate and produce a new cash crop of zero carbon electricity. Well, two of your points are water and biodiversity and the land steward stewardship project specifically speaks to, to both of those. That's why I was asking if you're aware. I'm more of their work, but I've not had a direct conversation with them about this idea. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Pastor, Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I just have a question in there having to do with uh, your sustainable, uh, the sustainable agriculture department at the University of Minnesota. Is that still around and are you working with them? You know, remember Mark Zumwinkle was going out and working with farmers trying to push sustainable ag and keeping the water on the land and um, all of that. What can you say about that? Uh, the Science Museum is partnering with the Forever Green program at the University of Minnesota. And the Forever Green program is, is um, dedicated to developing new perennial um, cash crops for farmers and new winter annual crops for farmers. The goal of Forever Green is, is to make it financially viable for farmers to at least convert some of their land to crops that perennially um, protect the soil year round. And uh, one of those crops, for example, is Kernza, which is a perennial variety of wheat. Well, how do you say it again? Kernza, K-E-R-N-Z-A. So, Wheat is an annual grass, but Kernza is a perennial grass. So you, you plant it once and you can get multiple crops from it, as opposed to wheat where you, you sow it, you plant it, you grow it, you harvest it, and you do it over and over again. So we actually, uh, last September, put in a demonstration plot of Kernza in the outdoor environmental demonstration space at the Science Museum, along with uh, a plot of perennial, um, perennial rye. So we're, we're working with them to help raise the visibility of the, of the need to increase the amount of Minnesota's landscape that has perennial vegetation on it. Okay, great. And so uh, there was a question I just saw flash by. Uh, what's the yield of, of Kernza compared to a, um, a conventional wheat crop? Kernza still produces significantly less wheat per uh, acre, yields significantly less per acre than, than annual wheat does. So it, it still doesn't compete um, with annual wheat on yield. But one of the things that's being done with Kernza is um, looking for uh, places to uh, plant it um, on top of well fields. So in, in large portions of, of Minnesota, in, in southern Minnesota, we have issues with nitrates getting into the groundwater because nitrate fertilizer gets applied to corn crops. Some of it isn't all taken up by corn. And then it, it eventually leaches down into the groundwater. Well, um, there is interest in actually um, encouraging farmers to plant Kernza in what are, what are called well protection fields, areas where we're trying to protect the quality of groundwater for uh, rural water supplies. And 
Kernza has an extremely deep root system, eight, 10, 12 feet in depth. So Kernza has, has proven adept at actually uh, extracting nitrogen out of soils that has gotten down so deep that it's no longer accessible by our annual row crops of corn and soybean. So um, sometimes farmers are being paid to plant Kernza, not just for the crop, but for its ability to protect um, and actually improve water quality. So uh, Doug or Ellie, I might have you read the questions off to me because they sometimes they, they shoot by before I can see them. Yeah, there's quite a few in here um, still. Um, what do we miss? Um, Scott asked if there are specific programs for rural solar. I'm not aware, no, I think what has typically been happening is that solar is such an attractive um, uh, crop, so to speak, that uh, solar developers have been uh, looking for sites in, in rural Minnesota that have easy access to transmission and, and uh, approaching farmers and, and asking if they are willing to sell, sell or lease some or all of their land for solar, that it, it doesn't require any price supports. It is a, a lucrative proposition as it is right now. And what I'm raising is that if we were more intentionally about how we cited solar on the rural landscape, we could gain even more benefits. Similar question, Kevin asked um, about hobby farms and that there are many acres of untilled land in and around the metro in these hobby farms, but many city ordinances have made limit amounts of solar installed. Is there anyone working to address this? That's another good question. And I'm afraid I don't know what the, uh, what the landscape uh, is in terms of trying to uh, change the, the zoning and that sort of urban rural interface of exurbia Um, Louis asked, how efficient are the present solar panels and how have they been improving? I bet there's someone who can answer that question better than I can. I know that they have improved. Uh, there's been steady improvement. Uh, I think that the polycrystalline are now, what, about between 15 and 18% efficient at converting sunlight into electricity. There are um, other other um, photovoltaic materials that are being investigated that have an even higher efficiency. And of course, the higher the efficiency that we get, the, the more attractive solar I think comes per acre. Of course, depending on that, what the actual cost of the panels are. All right. Um, I think we've gotten the rest of these in the chat, but um, if anyone didn't get their questions answered, you, if you wanna just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask anything that we haven't touched on, you can go ahead and do that. The other thing you can do too, is just go down to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand and Pat can call on you. Oh, I just saw a question. How do we, um, how do we raise this with, with resistant farmers. And I would, I would say that this um, solar is a, is a voluntary opportunity. Uh, no one is, is compelling farmers to put solar on their landscape. Um, solar developers are approaching farmers, landowners, um, and you know, uh, looking for locations that are both convenient for access to transmission and, and people who are willing to sell or, or lease their land. And I, I, th I think that oftentimes this is a, in either or situation, either uh, lease or sell all of your land, um, in which case uh, get a big cash buyout and, and retire as a, as a farmer. 
But one of the things I want to raise is that if we if we were able to distribute solar more broadly across the landscape, take advantage of these parcels of land that are difficult to cultivate, then I, I think it could be an and and situation. Farmers continue to cultivate their best lands while um, um, devoting some of their least attractive properties, most more difficult to cultivate, to solar. And uh, that it wouldn't be an, an either or situation. It'd be an other, a way of further diversifying their, their income. Because after all, solar um, uh, fee payments, annual fee payments would be guaranteed income for the duration of, uh, of a contract, you know, 20 or 25 years. So I think the, if we saw more of, of those incidences on, on our rural landscapes, we would see more farmers seeing the fact that they could continue to farm and also gain another line of income. Well, I'm gonna call on myself. Uh, Patrick, I was wondering, the, the other grain that you were talking about, is that, uh, is that turned into a flower or what, what kind of product is developed out of that? Uh, the Kernza. Yeah, the Kernza makes uh, a good flour. It makes an excellent beer, I must say. And uh, uh, several years ago, I had an opportunity to, uh, to visit the test plots at the University of Minnesota and actually see Kernza being grown. And then we went to um, uh, Bang Brewery where we had uh, a little happy hour to uh, sip some Kernza um, beer made from Kernza, and then we actually heard from a, a General Mills food scientist who was talking about um, her testing of, of Kernza in, in the products that General Mills makes. And she was quite effusive about Kernza because she said, uh, unlike other alternative uh, ingredients that she had ex experimented with in recent years, she didn't have to mask the flavor of Kernza. Kernza is delicious, makes a, a, a great flower. And uh, I've bought some of it online, Perennial Pantry. If you go to perennialpantry.com, you can, you can order Kernza flour and have it delivered to your house. And you can try it for yourself in bread, pancakes, anything that you would, you would otherwise use flour in. Yeah, very interesting. Any other questions out there? There's another one in here from Kevin. Is there an idea of cost per acres that solar rents? I know our family farm of 80 acres is rented to farmers, but if solar were more or similarly attractive, is there somewhere one can look for the benefit per acre? You no, know, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. If someone shoots me an email, and my email address is phamilton, at smm.org, I could see what information I, I could find. Um, I think that what we've um, heard anecdotally is that uh, the, uh, the lease payments are quite attractive because being able to produce 19 times more energy per, per acre compared to converting corn into ethanol uh, makes solar a very attractive option. Chris, I see you have your hand up. You are on mute. Chris, you're on mute. The complexity of climate change is also kind of uh, built into your whole presentation of the complexity of, of the solution and all of the ramifications and positive ways that it has on biodiversity and water and, and um, climate change. How do you package it other than a long PowerPoint presentation? I mean, you need a process diagram or a, um, you know what I'm saying? How do you sell this? 
um, in a way in, to audiences who think in black and white, you know, um, it, it's what makes it difficult, you know, partly is to look at how rich all of these solutions are. Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, it's an important point. Uh, every idea needs to be sold. Yeah. Yes, and um, I, I think that the, the challenge and the opportunity that we face with climate change is that we need to mitigate climate change now. We need to ag aggressively reduce carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere now. But climate change is already underway and it's going to continue and it's going to accelerate. And so we need to adapt to the climate changes that are underway and, and coming forward. And so what that means, I think, and I think the beauty of solar is that, and depending on how we put it on our landscapes, is that it can accomplish both. It can help us to mitigate climate change. It can also increase our resilience to climate change. Yes. With the politics of today, I just want to I know it's uh, too much to ask for the, this last question, but you see um, in the desperation of, oh, we need more energy fast, you know, with gas prices rising, there are those who just like, okay, now's the time to push for renewables or no, now's the time to drill more oil, you know, and, and we have some of our own saying, you gotta do everything. Um, what, what do you what do you say to the right now thing? How do you convince people who are on the, the fence of this politically? Is fresh energy doing that? Um, so um, I think that we're in a in a moment of, of crisis right now because we are facing the acute crisis of armed com conflict at the same time that we're facing the chronic crisis of long-term climate change. And so we, we need to address the fact that we live in a world now where we have to address and learn how to manage multiple crises simultaneously. And we're not going to um, turn the spigot on rapidly on, on, on any of these solutions. We need to set a path toward decarbonization and I think the, the reflection of the fact that, that oil and gas are extremely volatile in terms of price, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a measure of how renewable energy can help create a more stable both environment and also economic environment. Last night I was on a meeting with some people and it, it really hit me. Uh, I mean, talk about educating people. This lady was sharing that she was talking with a pastor in South Minneapolis about environmental problems and climate change. And he asked her, what is this greenhouse gas thing that you're talking about? I don't understand that. And I mean, it, it just it just shows that, you know, the level of knowledge, I mean, we all talk with each other and we, you know, most of us pretty much understand a lot of it, but man, it just, it, there's such a, a open gap there for educating people. And, I, and I'm, I'm guessing, Pat, that's, you know, I mean, you've been so much a part of that with the, with the science museum and stuff. Have you, have you looked at any trends? I mean, do you see the younger people really understanding this issue more? I talked to a guy today about electric vehicles, and he pointed that out that, you know, the young people are just right into EVs as soon as they can get them, where the older people are like, nah, I'm not going to try one of those. So is there, is there, you know, the demographics of, you know, dispersing this knowledge? Is it, is it being looked at or? Well, uh, I think that, uh, let me give you an example. So, um, um, the Yale Center for uh, Climate Change Communication um, does a, uh, a survey called the Six Americas, which, 
they've been doing for a number of years to, to analyze how trends, how the trend of climate change is changing across the United States. What's the level of concern or the level of dismissal? So I think the, the good news is that um, the level of concern about climate change in the American population has never been higher. It is, it has become a, a very um, prominent issue. It's not necessarily an issue that people talk about every day, but when they are asked about it, there is um, increasing awareness that this is a serious issue. To your point, Doug, if you ask them actually what the process of climate change was, how does carbon, carbon dioxide cause climate change? I wouldn't be surprised if they're if they grapple with that. But the, the public concern about climate change has increased markedly in recent years. And when it comes to young people, I, I, I think they, they share that concern. I think they are more con, even more concerned. And more importantly, they're more inclined to act on what on their concern and more inclined to articulate their concern about climate change. So I think that's the, the important opportunity of, of the younger generation. They, I think they feel a more vested interest and concern about this issue because they will be living it with the rest of their lives. It, it's, they, they feel it as a more ex existential issue than older generations do. And, but I think it's incumbent upon all of us to share that existential concern with them. Has, has the Science Museum created any like additional classes, uh, in-person, online kind of thing to, to, you know, inform people more about it? Or is that not the, the mission? <laughs> well, the uh, Science Museum adopted a public statement about climate change. Actually, we adopted our first statement about climate change back in 2014. And then last year, we uh, rewrote it and adopted a new statement about climate change. It's on our, on our website to reflect the fact that the science about, of climate change is even more clear, more adamant than it was eight years ago. And that the institution of the Science Museum is taking a much more vigorous, proactive role in climate change. Our statement back in 2014 was really an acknowledgement that climate change was real. And the statement that we adopted last year was really a statement of action about what the climate, the Science Museum was intending to do. And carbon neutrality was just a part of that, that overall action plan. Oh, that's great. Barbara? There is a small museum in Washington, DC, and I, I would have to look up what it is, but had a um, pretty, really good uh, exhibit about you know, carbon dioxide rising and, and what would cause the earth temperature to rise and so forth. So uh, that could be a model for others, I think. Yeah, I think you may be uh, referring to the, the museum that the National Academy of Sciences oh, that's it. established. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've, I've, I've met with those folks. I, I have visited the, uh, the museum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it, if a farmer had to choose between wind uh, power to, to have it on his land, which I know does pay, I don't know, you know, $10,000 a year or something per, per uh, uh, windmill, or solar, which I think even, even with the uh, reverse meter type rates, you have to kind of scratch to, to show that it works on your roof. I mean, it's a payback of you know 10 years or something like that. It surprises me that it would, I know that power companies have been you know, urged to use renewable energy and Excel has invested in a lot of solar and so forth and others have too, some, but uh, to, to even for the payback of even installing it and uh, you know paying for the panels and the installation and the perhaps power lines and the inverters and all that, uh, it's it's hard to believe that there'd be a lot left to pay for the rent for the land. Well, they, uh, 
Uh, rooftop solar is, is much more expensive than doing a utility scale uh, ground mount of solar. So um, you get an economy of scale when you're putting solar on multiple acres at a time as opposed to individual rooftops. And that makes the economics um, much more favorable. Yeah. And would Kwanzaa be a, um, there's a CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, that right. basically has the federal government rents marginal land or even specially land right by rivers and streams and so forth. And uh, it encourages native prairie and definitely perennial grasses. But I never heard Kwanzaa or, and, I, and particularly you're uh, prohibited from cash crops, I believe. So could Kwanzaa be in that mix and, and be harvestable? Is it even worth harvesting? I mean, if it's one tenth the weight of, uh, of uh, you know, of wheat uh, to run a, a reaper over it and so forth and process it, uh, it might not be even, you know, I'm sure if you can buy it on land, Kwanzaa online, that, that's fine. But how much more is it than than wheat? And people are willing to pay some for it just to try it or something. But as far as a food for, well, for animals or for you know vast numbers of people, um, is it really practical at all? Well, that's what the uh, University of Minnesota's Forever Green program is working on. So, Kernza now exists as a crop. So they're, they're working on, on multiple aspects of this crop. Yeah. One of them is increasing the yield yeah. per acre and also just increasing the number of acres that are actually um, planted in Kernza yeah. uh, here in Minnesota. Because right now there's just a few thousand acres of Kernza. So the goal is to, is to ramp that up significantly in the next few years while they continue to work to increase yield. And at the same time, making sure that any farmer that plants Kernza um, will find a market for the grain that they produce. I, I don't know if wild rice is a perennial or is it seeded from, you know, from the rice that happens to fall? It's seeded from, uh, it's an annual grass. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Well, if not, Patrick, we thank you so much. I, I really think you did a great presentation. It was very informative and it, it kind of gives us a new way to look at things. And on a personal level, it gives me a little more ammunition to be talking to some people uh, on the agricultural side of things, you know? There's just, uh, that's, that's very informative. So any other final thoughts from anybody? I want, to thank, I want to thank everyone who, who made interesting comments and in, uh, on the chat. Um, thank you very much, Pete and Kevin and everyone. Yeah, Pete just put in a very interesting one about what they're doing down in Southwest Wisconsin. So that was, that was a good one too. So well, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. The MRES uh, board members will be meeting uh, in, in about a half hour. And uh, so thanks again, Patrick, for, all, for your great information. Look forward and say hi to your wonderful wife. <laughs> I'll see her shortly. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, Pat. Patrick. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.